Father, we pray, we long to hasten the day of your return. You are going to come back and receive the glory that is due your name, and we, we long for that to be soon, and we also have to confess, Lord, that at times we don't long for it nearly strong enough. And so as we um, sing your praises and as we minister one to another, I pray that we would always be mindful of the day of your return. This morning, Lord, as we turn our attention to the gospel of Mark, you've given us an account of the calling of the disciples in such a way that we have every opportunity to benefit. And I want to pray, Lord, that as a result of studying this incredible story, that we would be strengthened, refreshed, renewed, that our hearts would be vigorously warmed to the reality of discipleship, what that looks like, what that means as it was modeled by your son. I pray that um, this morning, Lord, your spirit would even use your truth to equip us to be able to disciple and be discipled better and in a more Christ-like way to a, to a more effective goal and target of the, the mandates that you have given to us. And so I pray, Lord, that you would glorify your name through this church, through our discipleship, as we seek humbly uh, to live out the, the pattern set before us. In your name we pray. Amen. You may take a seat, and I want to ask you to grab your Bible and open up to the Gospel of Mark. Gospel of Mark, chapter 3. As I mentioned in my prayer, we're going to be looking at the calling of the 12 disciples, the 12 apostles, as they are called, the sent ones, that uh, Jesus chose to train for ministry. The story is, starts in chapter 3, verse 13, and it goes all the way through verse 19. So I want to read this story, and I want to ask you to follow along as I read this paragraph. In verse 13, he is, of course, Christ. And Christ went up on the mountain and summoned those whom he himself wanted, and they came to him. And he appointed twelve so that they would be with him, and that he could send them out to preach, and to have authority to cast out the demons. And he appointed the twelve, Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter, and James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James, to them he gave the name Boanerges, which means sons of thunder. And Andrew, and Philip, and Bartholomew, and Matthew, and Thomas, and James the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. Following Christ is the occupation of every Christian. We must all be disciples of Christ. And when it comes to discipleship, sometimes we, we might have a, a vague or ill-defined notion of what it means to, to follow Christ. And so I titled this Following Christ, and maybe a subtitle would be Discipleship 101. This is really an insight uh, into how Christ viewed discipleship. He chose his disciples in this story, and we learn a lot about his discipleship just by looking at who he chose, who he, who he cho chose and, who he, um, and, and the purpose for which he called them. And when we think about our own discipleship, at times it can be difficult to uh, really figure out what is it that I'm supposed to be doing. If I gave you an impromptu meeting tomorrow with somebody who said, hey, can you disciple me? What would that meeting involve? What would take place? And if, if we're a little bit unnerved by that, if there's a gap in our thinking about what that would look like, if I get some time with a fellow brother or sister in Christ and I want to disciple them or pour into them in some way, well then hopefully this passage will help fill in any gaps that you might have about what discipleship really is. This, this story really breaks up quite simply into two halves. Verses 13 to 15 is the purpose of discipleship, and then in verses 16 to 19 are the people. So the purpose and the people, let's take them one at a time. First of all, the purpose. It starts in verse 13, and it just simply explains that he goes up on a mountain, and uh, he summons those whom he himself wanted, and they come to him. Now this is a fantastic statement, because 
Discipleship starts with Jesus summoning these men. He calls them, he summons them, he invites them, and who does he invite? Those whom he wanted. <laughs> it's his own desire. Uh, being a disciple of Christ is, is you, you, God wanted you to follow him. God chose you to follow him. And uh, it's interesting, you know, uh, in the parallel account in Luke, in Luke chapter 6, that it says that he goes up on the mountain to pray. He spends the entire night in prayer. He is corresponding with his father. And of course, whenever Jesus prayed, uh, save, of course, uh, his final prayer where, where the father was already uh, severed a relationship with him judicially because of his atonement. But whenever he prays and calls his father, father, uh, he has intimate union with the Father. They have incredible correspondence, and he starts pouring out his heart to the, God the Father in heaven about these men. And he's praying for them and about them. And after all night in prayer, he calls whom he wants, whom he desires. It's a simple truth. Discipleship starts with the will of Christ. No one becomes a disciple of Christ because they force their way into his inner circle against his better judgment. He chooses his disciples. Now, of course, salvation works this way. But I do want to make a little caveat here between this calling of 12 disciples and salvation. Obviously, God saves whom he wills. In Romans 9, verse 11, verse 16, verse 18, describe that. It's not according to man who runs or man who wills. It's not according to our effort. It's not according to our desire. I made myself a disciple. I was a good enough person. I decided to follow Christ because at least I had enough sense to say he's worthy of following. None of that qualifies me for a disciple. It doesn't depend on me. If it did, I wouldn't be Christ's disciple if it depended on me. Depends on God who wills, and here it depends on Christ who wills. In Mark chapter three, verse thirteen. But this calling here is different than effectual salvation, as we will see, because in the list that we just read, by the time you get to the end of the list, and most notably, you see that it ends with Judas Iscariot, as it says in verse nineteen, who betrayed him. So he calls these twelve, and included in the twelve are actually uh, one unbeliever. But these are exactly who God the Father wanted for Christ's disciples, and these are exactly who Christ wanted for his disciples. He makes no mistake. Well, verse 14 continues, it just says, he appointed the 12, and then it gives us two purpose statements. And these two purpose statements are absolutely critical, because we, first of all, we need to understand what Jesus is doing in his discipleship. And I'll just say, before we dive into verse 14 and these two purpose statements, uh, it's probably important to remind ourselves that we are not diving into this primarily or preeminently to do the work of a historian and just to figure out, what did Jesus do when he discipled? That's, a, that's our first step, but that's not our ultimate goal. We need to understand what Jesus did when he called his disciples and why he was discipling them, how he discipled them, who he was discipling, in order to benefit from Christ's example, the question that we're trying to get to is what aspects of what we're reading here is actually become, does it become foundational for us as Christians when we are following Christ and we also must be disciplers and being discipled? And so we're asking that question. Uh, so we've got to start with what Jesus did so that we can get to the question of what do we do? In verse 14, he appointed the 12 for two reasons. Number one, so that they would be with him, and number two, so that he could send them. So I, I, I just basically outlined that time and task. There's time and there's a task. The time is the time that Jesus wants with the disciples, the time he needs with the disciples, the time they need with him, and then there's a task involved, namely the sending. One commentator said this phrase, to be with him, has atomic significance in the Gospel of Mark. Discipleship is a relationship before it is a task. A who before a what. That's right. That's exactly right. Discipleship is a who before it's a what. The word disciple means learner. It means learner. And by, by virtue of application, the way you would learn and uh, the Greco-Roman era is you would learn by sitting at the feet of a teacher, and so it has to do with learning slash 
following. It's not learning in some sort of bookish sense. It's learning in the sense of learning a trade, being an apprentice, sitting at the feet of a teacher, a master. And so Jesus is calling these men so that they could be his disciples, so that he could disciple them. And the first purpose of his discipleship is time. He wants time with these men. He wants to influence them. He wants to influence them for the better. It's funny because, you know, we talk about this uh, when it comes to uh, marriage or when it comes to parenting. How do you spell love? T-I-M-E, right? And that's just kind of an axiom that we use because we know that to actually have a relationship, to actually influence, it just takes a ton of time. It's just a profound statement in verse 14 that that's actually the very first purpose statement of Jesus' discipleship. He wants time with them. Why'd you call these 12? I want time with them. What, what are you going to do with them? I want time with them. I want a relationship with them. I want them to get to know me. I want to get to know them. We've got to have some time together. Think about the time involved for Jesus to disciple these 12 He spent over three years living with them, day in, day out, with rarely a break. He spent private time with them, away from the crowds. In fact, I want to show you one example. This is worth looking at. Look at Mark chapter 6, verse 31 and 32. Notice what happens here. Jesus is so intense and so set on getting personal time with his disciples that he said to them, Come away by yourselves to a secluded place and rest a while. And Mark has to explain that. For there were many people coming and going, and they did not even have time to eat. They went away in a boat to a secluded place by themselves. And getting to that secluded place leads to the feeding of the 5,000. Because they are so attracted to Christ that they are flocking after him and just following him. He goes in a boat, they're going to follow on shore, and they're like, well, he's got to land somewhere. We're going to circle this thing until we find out where he's at. And so it leads to another massive ministry with the crowds of the 5,000 in verses 33 and following. But the original intent was to get time with his disciples, private time, secluded time. He's, got, he's already sent them out on a mission from chapter 6, verse 7, all the way through verse 30, and they're telling him what they, what they taught and what they did and all their ministry activities. And he's like, we got to sit down, we got to debrief, we got to talk about ministry. I got to spend time with you. This, is, this requires time. And they didn't even have the freedom, Mark says, to eat. They're just so pressed. And all the demands of the people, Jesus is prioritizing time with his disciples. Often the only time he could find um, alone was while his disciples were sleeping. As Luke 6, verse 12 says, he'd spend all night in prayer um, on that particular evening just to have time with his father. But it seemed, you get the sense that Jesus is willing to sacrifice time and exhaustion in order to pour into these men. It's almost, you're almost lacking for examples where Jesus is off by himself when these disciples are awake. And even when they're sleeping, he's still with them, <laughs> as Gethsemane would show. This This time is intense. This time requires modeling. It required him to give them the freedom to minister and even potentially fail, as I mentioned in Mark chapter 6, verses 7 to 30. It requires great patience on Jesus' part as he gives them freedom to minister and also fail. He also shows extreme patience, not only with their failures or mistakes, but their ignorance and their sin. The time involved is incredible. By way of connection, we're gonna, I'm going to start to kind of even turn the corner towards application as we think about what it means to be in a church where we're serious about discipleship. And to start applying it even to us, I don't want to quickly get there. We're going to get there to the end, hopefully. But I want to start connecting some dots even to Paul. Paul himself says something interesting in 1 Corinthians 4, 16. He says, be imitators of me. But then later in the same letter, 1 Corinthians 11, 1, he says, follow me as I follow Christ. And that's really the secret to all discipleship. The only way we could be involved with discipleship is the way that Paul and Jesus both modeled it, is to be in 
union and in fellowship with God so that when we spent time together, it would actually produce more following of Christ. See, time is not it. We could spend all sorts of aimless time. We could be poorly, we could have the wrong target with our time. We could have all sorts of social time. And it could just be a wasting of time of people-oriented people enjoying a social environment. The, the, The issue with discipleship is it absolutely requires time, but it's focused time. It's focused on following Christ. In fact, let me give you the example of Paul from Acts chapter 20. You don't have to turn there if you want, but just listen to this. Acts chapter 20, he meets up with the Ephesian elders, and remember, he ministered with the Ephesian elders for three years. So when Paul says this statement, this was modeled by Paul for over three years with the church at Ephesus. And he says in verse 18, you yourselves know from the first day I set foot in Asia how I was with you the whole time serving the Lord with all humility, with tears and with trials, which came upon me through the plots of the Jews, how I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you publicly and from house to house. I mean, this is day, night, publicly, house to house, privately, exhorting, instructing, opening up scripture with tears. He's spending time with them to the point that he could make that statement. And the Ephesian church isn't going to be like, wait a minute, when was that? He can just point to three years of modeling this amount of time commitment to the church. And they're like, yep, yep, we remember that. Three years you did that. Let me give you one more example, because this really is helpful for us um, in the church. Because Paul modeled this with Timothy. Listen to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 10. Here's what he said to Timothy, his young, his young uh, um, convert from, uh, who was in the ministry there at Ephesus. He says in 1 Timothy 3.10, Now you followed my teaching, my conduct, purpose, faith, patience, love, perseverance, persecutions and sufferings such as happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured and out of all of them the Lord rescued me. Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. But evil men and imposters will proceed from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. You, however, continue in the things you have learned. That's what a disciple is. It's somebody who has learned, and it required over a decade with Timothy. No, I don't think that's a commentary on Timothy being a slow learner. I think that's a commentary on the depth at which, which, which Paul was discipling. You, however, continue in the things which you have learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom you have learned them. And so discipleship is a learning of of what it looks like to live a life pleasing to Christ and honoring to Christ. And Christ himself modeled that. That's the first task. That's the first purpose, sorry. The first purpose is time. The second purpose is task. And I think these two items need to be held in balance. Because, you know, we could actually fall prey to the idea that, hey, as long as we just have time together, then, you know, discipleship happened. Which, well, that, that that would be neglecting the second purpose. But then we can also make the mistake of looking at the second purpose. The second purpose is the task, the task of of ministry, whatever task of ministry God calls us to. And we could focus on that task and, you know, imagine that we could actually get there without the time that it takes to disciple people to get there. And so these two purposes have to be held in balance. Time and task. Let's look at the task. Back to Mark chapter 3. Mark chapter 3, verse... um, 14, at the end there, is the second that. So so that he could be with them is the, is the time element um, and the relationship element. And then 14c is so that he could send them. So that he could send them out. And this sending out then in turn has two purposes, two tasks specifically for these 12, namely to preach at the end of verse 14 and verse 15 to have authority to cast out demons. And so that's why I just said on this task element, I'm just going to highlight preaching the gospel and authority over demons. Preaching the gospel and authority over the demons. As we will see, the lives of these apostles was filled with preaching and supernatural miracles. Supernatural authority over uh, the demonic world. Save only Judas Iscariot. The other 11 live exemplary lives 
devoted to the preaching of God's word and the preaching of the truth. The birth of the church in Acts chapter 2 came via a sermon. The entire book of Acts is full of sermons, whether it's Peter, Stephen, whether it's Philip, whether it's Paul, it's just full of sermons. And as we're going to see, the church was brought to India, to Turkey, to Egypt, to the Atlantic coast of Africa, and Britain via the men listed in verses 16 to 19. How did it get there through these men? Through preaching. How will people hear without preaching? There's no, there's no church, there's no gospel proclamation without preaching, and of course, yeah, and that's not this, to admit that there's anomalies of people, you know, opening up a Bible in a hotel room and being radically converted. Of course that happens because the Word of God is in their language and they have a copy of it right there on a, and the Spirit of God is, is bringing conviction and of course he's going to use that. But the, Paul is very clear. How are they going to hear without a preacher? Someone has to be sent, someone has to bring the message and even with translation, there has to be a preacher Verse 15, to have authority to cast out demons. This becomes very clear. The 12 have authority to cast out demons. In fact, as I mentioned in chapter 6, let me turn back to chapter 6 real quick. In chapter 6 of Mark, um, it says in verse 7 that he summoned the 12, Mark 6, verse 7, he summons the 12 and he began to send them out in pairs and gave them authority over the unclean spirits and he instructed them they should take nothing for their journey. And then... Um, He says, uh, do not, uh, whenever you enter a house, verse 10, stay there till you leave town and any place that does not receive you or listen to you as you go out from there, verse 11, shake the dust off the soles of your feet as a testimony against them. And then verse 12, they went out and preached that men should repent and they were casting out many demons and were anointing with oil many sick people and healing them. The order is very clear. The order of Jesus' example throughout the Gospel of Mark is he came to preach, and he also casts out demons. And the casting out of demons affirms the divine origin of his message. The same is true here, verse 12, they went out and preached, the men should repent. Verse 13, they were also casting out demons, that affirms the divine origin of their message. But notice how the order gets inverted. In Mark chapter 6, verse 30, the apostles gathered together with Jesus, and they reported to him all that they had done and taught. And the order gets flipped. What we skipped was the notable story of John the Baptist who had his head cut off for preaching repentance in the middle of the story about the disciples getting sent out to go preach repentance. And they come back after preaching repentance and they're like, hey, let me tell you all the cool stuff we did and taught. Yeah, yeah, we had a message, of course. But I mean, there was cool stuff we did. We had power and authority over demons. Isn't that amazing? And they're starting to get their, even the order inverted but they legitimately had this authority. So did the 70, by the way. In the Gospel of Luke, it records that the 70 were also given authority over demons. What's very clear is that other than this apostolic group of 12 and the disciples uh, called the 70 who were attending to Christ's personal ministry, what's very clear is that that authority is not extended to uh, other Christians. And let me give you just one example of that. In Acts chapter 19, a non-apostle, a non-member of the 70, tries to uh, pull rank that he's never been given by God, and it goes very poorly for him. Look at Acts chapter 19. Miracles are happening through the Paul, just like with all the other apostles, and it even says in Mark, uh, sorry, Acts 19, verse 12, to the point that even handkerchiefs or aprons were even carried from his body to the sick and diseases are leaving them and the evil spirits are going out. I mean, this is incredible power. This is obviously documentable and recognizable by the populace uh, at Ephesus. They know exactly this is legitimate. Verse 13, but also some of the Jewish exorcists who went from place to place attempted to name over those who had the evil spirits the name of the Lord Jesus saying, I adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preaches. And they start invoking authority over demons. And they're appealing to the authority of their own creator and the creator of the demons, the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And lest there be a confusion about which Jesus, it's the Jesus whom Paul preaches. This is the right individual. They, however, had no authority. 
Verse 14, seven sons of one Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, were doing this. And the evil spirit answered and said to them, I recognize Jesus and I know about Paul, but who are you? And the man in whom was the evil spirit leaped on them and subdued all of them and overpowered them. And the word overpowered is a word from, it's, it's, a, it's, it's the same word for the word Lord, but it, it's a, the verb form of Lord. It's like just dominated. They, he just, they absolutely dom, got dominated by this, by this demon-possessed individual so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. This became known to all, both Jews and Greeks, who lived in Ephesus, and fear fell upon them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was being magnified. I mean, these demons recognize authority. They recognize the authority of Christ. They recognize the authority of his apostles. Jesus gives his 12 authority to cast out demons, but I wanted to go ahead and connect some dots for you. That certainly is one of those aspects of this calling that do, is not extended to us. Um, I'm not an apostle. You're not an apostle. None of us are eyewitnesses of the res resurrected Christ, and God did not give us direct revelation that even needs to be verified. We are called to preach the, the revelation already confirmed by those miracles in the scriptures. But nevertheless, that's their authority. He gave them the mandate, the task, the, 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 the target of preaching and casting out demons. That's what they were supposed to do. That's the task they aimed at. So let me summarize it this way. Verses 14 and 15, we can say, discipleship is a matter of being with Christ, devoted to being like him, doing what he has asked us to do, and learning from him how to do it. And think about the importance of this discipleship for this particular group of men. It's, we're going to find out this is a radically diverse group of men. What unifies them is who they are following, who they are learning from, and whose commission they are carrying out. So let's quickly look at the men, the people. So number, number one, the purpose in verses 13 to 15. Now number two, the people, verses 16 to 19. He appointed the 12. Literally, he made 12. He just made it. He appointed it. He kind of set up and created this, this, uh, the identity of this group of men, the 12. He starts to list them out starting with Peter. And if you want to compare, you, could, you can compare uh, the list of the names of the apostles. It's kind of interesting if you do that. You can look at Matthew chapter 10, verses 2 through 4. Uh, you can look at Mark 3 here, verses 16 to 19. You can, look at, you can look at Luke chapter 6, verses 14 to 16. And then again in Acts chapter 1, verse 13. So Luke gives us two, two, two records in Luke and then in Acts. And then you have the accounts in Matthew and Mark. And if you compare the list of the 12, they all agree with the notable difference, of course, that Acts chapter 1 verse 13 is only 11. Judas is not listed there because he's already dead and obviously not a disciple. The other differences are just differences in nicknames versus given names and a few details, but the, the actual uh, content of who composes the 12 is identical in all four. So I made a list, I made a chart of all the list of the uh, names of the apostles, and I was looking at it, and it was kind of interesting. Um, it's just, it was just fascinating seeing that in, in all four of them, Peter starts them all. He's the, he's the notable leader of this group. He's, he's the first in, in every single, in all four of these. Um, and the group, the group of, of the apostles group up into uh, groups of four. The first four uh, names are the same four names in all four lists, although the order might change among those four. The second four are the same four names among all those lists, although the, the order might change. And the last four names are all the same, except the order might change. Well, and of course, in the Acts, the, you know, Judas is not listed, as I mentioned. But otherwise, the first four, the next four, and the next four are all the same group of men. So Mark starts with Peter and then moves to James and John, and then goes back to Andrew, who is Peter's brother. Whereas, for instance, Matthew is going to say Simon and Andrew, the brothers, and then James and John, the brothers. And so he kind of starts more of like a biological relationship there. But nevertheless, it's those four in all four lists. Well, what I want to do is I want to work through this list and briefly give you a little bit of information about each one of them. Not, of course, this is not comprehensive. Um, this might actually, uh, you know, hopefully it doesn't bore anyone to tears. The, what I want to do is I want to share some details of each of these disciples because it's pr important for the understanding of what Jesus is doing by way of discipleship to see the radical difference here among these men. First of all, 
What does Mark highlight about Simon? He says, to whom he gave the name Peter. And that, that occurs in John chapter 1, verse 42. He meets um, Simon and says, You're gonna, your name is Peter, uh, the rock, Cephas in Aramaic. Cephas is the Aramaic translation. Peter is the, the, the Greek. Petros is the Greek of the same name. So his, his human name is Simon. That's his, his parents gave him that name. Peter, or Cephas, is the name Christ gave him. And it's interesting that in the renaming of these disciples, as you see, not only was Peter renamed, but it's explicit about James and John that, he gave, that Jesus gave them the name Boanerges. We'll get to that in a second. But what's also interesting is even some of these guys have nicknames, like Thaddeus. Uh, he, that's actually um, James uh, in, in, the, in Luke's list and in, Ac, in, the, in the list in Acts. Um, I'm sorry, not James. That's, that's Judas. Judas, the uh, brother of James. That's Judas, James's brother. So there's a Judas, not Iscariot, but a Judas who was given the name Judas by his parents who got the nickname Thaddeus. And so he's called Thaddeus in Matthew's account and Mark's account. So you have a lot of guys in this list whose names are re-given. It's important to appreciate and understand that the changing of names has a precedent. Abraham was Abram. Sarah and Sarai Jacob, Israel, Saul to Paul. In all these examples, you have, a, you have a, a precedent where God is renaming someone for the sake of a purpose, for the sake of a task, and it's a significant name that's given to them. But it also has a negative precedent, as we've been hearing in, uh, in Daniel on Sunday nights. It's just been incredible looking at what's happening to our, our, our faithful remnant, even among the, the Babylonian exile, because Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and um, Azariah, all robust, richly significant Hebrew names being changed in a negative fashion to um, Babylonian names, Belteshazzar, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and so the significance is lost. In both instances, it has the significance of showing some sort of ownership or authority. One commentator said this way, in biblical uh, thought, changing the name exhibits the power of the namer. It occurs often in the context of a new stage or new mission. Even going all the way back to the creation account, God entrusted Adam with dominion. Dominion was given to Adam by virtue of being created in the image of God. And so Adam names all the creation. That, was a, that showed some sort of authority and power of the namer. And so the same is happening here. If it's a negative instance of the king of Babylon trying to show authority over these Jews, or in the context of those patriarchs, God the Father, changing their names and calling them. So here Peter is called, I'm sorry, Simon is called Peter. So let me just give you a little snapshot of Peter. And let me just start with, not Peter as Peter, the apostle, nearly named by Christ, but let's just start with Peter as Simon. Here's Simon. Simon was married. He was a fisherman. He was successful. He possessed a large house. He was a dominant type A term personality, as seen by the fact that they all list him first numerically, and Matthew even lists him and labels him as the first or foremost in chapter 10, verse 2 of the Gospel of Matthew. Um, he's often um, the speaker for the 12. It's interesting if you compare parallel accounts, um, for instance, of uh, Mark 7, 17, it just says the disciples questioned him about the parable that he had just shared. But in the parallel in Matthew 15, 15, it says Peter said, quote, explain the parable to us. And so he's kind of the spokesman, the representative for the 12 at times. He had the foot-shaped mouth. He's very fond of saying some ridiculous things. And... Um, he, he has extremes that are positive and extremes that are negative. I mean, just here's one snapshot. Remember John 13, the, the washing of the feet? Uh, Peter's just like, you're going to wash my feet? I don't think so. Eh, not going to happen. He's like, it better happen if you have any part of me. Oh, if I have any part of you? Well, then not, if, not just my feet, my whole bath as well. And so it's like he goes from not even wanting to do it to like diving headfirst into the bowl. I mean, he's just so extreme. He's a, a question asker. He asks good questions. He asks bad questions. <laughs> He, he's, he's pretty, it's pretty interesting that, you know, on the Mount of Transfiguration, he's the only one who really had anything to say. And he's trying to take it all in as Jesus of Nazareth, whom he spent time with, just unzips his humanity in front of him. And he's, 
seen divine glory and he's seen Moses and Elijah and he just says, uh, should I put up three tents? Just, wait, what? You just turn this into a camping trip? What are you talking about? <laughs> And the, the scripture writer has to say, because he didn't know what he was talking about. You're like, why does that make any sense? Because it didn't make any sense. <laughs> he, but he, he's so bold that even when he can't even make sense of what he's taking in, he's still willing to speak. So he makes a fool out of himself at times. But there was this raw, tremendous impetus to show initiative. There was a boldness that was commendable, he answers Christ when the others were hesitant and fearful in Matthew 16, 16. There was a boldness that was foolhardy, cutting off Malchus's ear in the face of 600 armed Roman soldiers when Jesus even said, you, you know, you're not going to stand. And he's like, okay, no, I am going to stand. So he's going to take on a co whole cohort. There was also a boldness that was flat out equivalent with satanic thinking probably second only to not standing for Christ on the last night when he denied Jesus three times. Probably second only to that would have been Matthew 16 where he rebukes the Lord. And Jesus has to call him Satan because his thinking was absolutely satanic. Because he was setting his interests, he was focusing on the interests of man, not the interests of God. He possessed a stubborn and even influential pride. He was influential on the other disciples in a negative sense. Look at, look at Mark chapter 14, verses 28 to 31. Jesus says, After I've been raised, I'll go ahead of you to Galilee. In verse 29, Peter says to him, Even though all men may fall away, yet I will not. Okay, that's... That's bold. You kind of want to leave it hanging in the balance for a second. Isn't that, isn't that full of faith? Well, verse 30, Jesus said to him, Truly I say to you that this very night before a rooster crows twice, you yourself will deny me three times. But Peter kept saying insistently, Even if I have to deny, die with you, I will not deny you. And they were all saying the same thing also. You know what, though? We don't have to get to verse 30 and 31 before we realize that the statement in verse 29 is foolhardy because Jesus just got through quoting the scripture. Zechariah chapter 13, verse 7, I will strike down the shepherd, the sheep will be scattered. And Peter's like, nope, not me. I don't care what Zechariah prophesied, I'm going to stand. Jesus turns around and makes a personal prediction, you're going to deny me three times. And he says, I don't care what you say, I'm going to stand. He experienced the most incredible failure in denying his Lord three times. And during the trial, makes eye contact with the Lord Jesus, knowing he had failed, knowing he was full of nothing but arrogant, satanic, hot air. And he wept. That's Simon. What about Peter? It took those kind of trials and that kind of discipleship, that kind of relationship, that amount of failure, that amount of instruction from our Lord to turn him into the Peter that you see in the book of Acts. He was indeed the rock upon which the church was built when he preached the first two sermons of the Christian church. And 5,000 men plus women were saved and baptized in Acts 2 and Acts 4. He is heroically and uncompromisingly leading the first church discipline scenario in Acts chapter 5. He suffers for the gospel and rejoices at the privilege in Acts 5.41. He brings the gospel to the Gentiles in Acts 10 and 11. And he remained humble and teachable even being, after being established as an elder of the church of Jerusalem. For instance, when Paul has to confront him on his hypocrisy in Galatians chapter 2. Peter was something else. You can recognize some of the natural traits from the Simon, but that was some successful discipleship. 
John Fox, the uh, 16th century church historian, says this, the apostle Peter was condemned and crucified as, as some write at Rome. Jerome says that after he had been bishop of the church of Antioch and had preached to the dispersed of them that believed of the circumcision in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia in the second year of the emperor Claudius, AD 44, he came to Rome to withstand Simon Magus and there kept the priestly chair the space of five and 20 years until the last year of Nero, by whom he was crucified, his head being down and his feet upward, himself so requiring, because he was, he said, unworthy to be crucified after the same form and manner as the Lord was. And that's how Peter died. Now, if you're looking at the time and you're thinking, okay, one, one disciple and that took that long, don't worry, it gets, quick, it gets quicker. Some of these guys we, hard, we know next to nothing about. I can just tell you their name and that's, boom, that's all we know. So it's gonna pick up, so just don't, don't worry. James and John. James and John, though, of course, we know a ton about, and I just want to highlight some things that are helpful for us in thinking about Jesus' uh, discipleship. Again, this is not a biography. This is to highlight Jesus' discipleship. Uh, Mark records that with, with James and John, they're, they're, they're the son, son of Zebedee, James, and John's the brother of James, so obviously they're both sons of Zebedee. But what's interesting is that Mark records something that no one else records. We don't get this anywhere else in Scripture, that he gave them the nickname Boanerges. And Mark gives us a translation, it just means sons of thunder. And uh, the Aramaic of Boanerges would just basically be literally like something along the lines of sons of restlessness or sons of unrest. And so the, the issue here is, is not, not just, you know, you know, just some sort of uh, loudness or noise, it could mean that. But as the cognates in most of, these, most of the Semitic languages use this word, it means something like restlessness or unrest. It means angry, uneasy, excited, starting a rebellion or, distur- or a disturbance. And so there's, a, there's like a volatility here. There's an intensity to these guys. Don't think of them as like, you know, little kids who are just kind of rambunctious on the playground, tackling each other, you know, tearing jeans and skinning knees. No, these are, these are two guys who don't play well with others, and they don't play well with anybody. They are very volatile. They come from an intense family. They are naturally excitable and fiery. Certain stories display this intensity and reveal an agitation that is not atypical to these two. In fact, let me just, just for the sake of time, I'll just give you one, Luke chapter 9. Listen to Luke chapter 9. Why is it important to look at this? Because I want you to see exactly what Jesus was doing and what he was up against in his discipleship. That's why this is important. Luke chapter 9, verse 51, when the days were approaching for his ascension, he was determined to go to Jerusalem. And he sent messengers on ahead of him, and they went and entered a village of the Samaritans to make arrangements for him. But they did not receive him because he was traveling toward Jerusalem. So because the Samaritans are opposed to the Jews and there is um, a proud element of just animosity, even racism toward the, the, the Jews, Samaritans being um, half Jews, half Assyrian in their, in their lineage, they didn't even receive Jesus just simply because of his destination. Verse 54, when, he, when his disciples, James and John, there we go, when they saw this, they said, Lord, you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume these guys? It's just another day in the life of, for James and John, they're sons of thunder. But he turned and rebuked them, and they went on to another village. I mean, it's just, all that deserves is a, a hearty rebuke. That's who these guys are. We read of James martyrdom in Acts chapter 12, verse 2. He's beheaded by Herod Agrippa I. Regarding John, we know that he was the only one of the of the apostles who did not die a martyr's death. Under Domitian in the persecution at the end of the first century, he was exiled to Patmos. Um, he was set, he suffered intensely. Fox writes that he was put in a vessel of boiling oil by the proconsul of Ephesus. He also records several miracles that happened during John's life as he's writing, obviously, a gospel, three letters, and the book of Revelation. And then after his banishment, um, he went back on to minister uh, the word until his death, and he ministered in Ephesus uh, basically till the end of the first century. And uh, John Fox writes that he died at the age of 120, died a very old man. That's James and John. 
Andrew is the last in this, in this first group of four. So when it comes to the first four disciples, all four are the same, but Andrew being the brother of Peter is second in some lists. He's fourth in Mark's list. Even among the triad, Peter, James, and John, he's in, sometimes included in the triad. For example, in Mark chapter 13, verse 3 is one instance. But he would probably be on the periphery compared to those three. We know he was a former, a former disciple of, of John the Baptist. Um, uh, I almost said he was a former Baptist. That would have been totally, something totally uh, different. Um, that's in John chapter 1, verse 40. He was a disciple of John the Baptist. Uh, he, was, he evangelized Peter and brought Peter to Christ in John 1, verses 41 to 43. In John 6, verse 8, he volunteers the boy's lunch for the feeding of the 5,000. And in John 12, 20 um, to 22, uh, when the Greeks approach Philip, it's Philip and Andrew who take them to, to Christ. He's, he's more than once seen bringing people to Christ. Tradition tells us that he preached to the Scythians, the Saxons. Um, through his diligent preaching, he became under um, the assault of Aegeus, a governor. And Aegeus basically said, if you keep preaching this, you're going to receive the cross. And he said, O cross, most welcome and long looked for, with a willing mind, joyfully and desirously, I come to you, being um, the, uh, the scholar of him which did hand on thee. Because I have always been your lover, speaking of the cross, and have coveted to embrace thee. So, being crucified, Fox ends, he yielded up the ghost and fell asleep. And so there's another martyr for the gospel. What about Philip? Our fifth on the list in Mark chapter 3 is Philip. Philip was a boyhood friend of Philip of Peter and Andrew. They were both, they were all three from the same town, Bethsaida, according to John 1:44. And uh, Jesus sought Philip out in John 1, and then Philip, in turn, sought out Nathanael. Jesus tests him in John 6, and Philip is frequently asking questions of Christ, like, for instance, in John 14, verse 8. Possibly timid, as John 12, 20 to 22 seems to indicate, and that's pretty much all we know about Philip from the Scriptures. John Fox says, Philip the Apostle, after he had labored much in preaching the word of salvation, suffered in Hierapolis, being crucified and stoned to death. Bartholomew just means son of Ptolemy. Ptolemy or Ptolemy was a Hebrew name, and, and um, so this is just, just kind of like a, uh, just, just, that's just his name. That's, he's the son of, that's his father's name. Um, he's listed uh, in the second group um, in all four accounts, and um, some guess that Bartholomew is Nathaniel from John 1 and John 21, but that would give us no more information except his hometown being Cana. John Fox tells us a little bit about his life. Bartholomew is said to have preached to the Indians and, after, and to have translated the gospel of St. Matthew into their tongue, where he continued a great space, doing many miracles. At last in Albania, after diverse persecutions, he was beaten down with staves, then crucified, and after being flayed, he was at length beheaded. He suffered greatly. Next in the list is Matthew. Matthew, we've already been introduced to him in chapter 2, verses 13 and 14. He was called by Jesus Christ in chapter, in chapter 2. He was a tax collector. He worked for the state. He worked for the Roman government. He penned the first gospel. Um, he was considered the vilest of all Jews because he was a tax collector. Uh, he, worse than some intelligent criminal like Simon the Zealot, who is basically, uh, you know, like the equivalent of like almost a terrorist out of his overwhelming zeal for, for uh, Jewish freedom, Matthew would be viewed like a Benedict Arnold. He's befriended the foreign occupation of the Roman establishment, and he starts, he's taken up a contract with them to collect taxes from his own town according to the census, which would establish an amount that he would raise. And anything that he raised from taxes above the contract amount, he would be able to pocket. That's how tax players get paid. His wealth would be viewed as the byproduct of betrayal of one Jew to another to get rich off of alliance with Rome. If, of course, Matthew didn't pay Rome, he didn't pay the, the contract amount, that meant big problems for Matthew. And so a guy like Matthew would have to have 
a lot of hitmen who uh, would probably take out, do it as dirty work to enforce what he needs for his, to, to make his living. That's Matthew. Matthew uh, um, wrote our first gospel, and here he is in ministry with, as we'll see, Simon the Zealot. I mean, the mix just couldn't get crazier. Next in Mark's list is Thomas. Thomas, uh, sometimes you hear him called Doubting Thomas. He's, he's, the, he's kind of the Eeyore of the Twelve. He's always the guy who just kind of struggles to, you know, he's doubting, he's, he's got a little bit of pessimism, he's struggling to have a triumphant faith at times, and he's also called Didymus, which just means twin, so he would have had a twin brother or a twin sibling. But listen to uh, what happens here in John 11, verse 16. Um, oh, no wonder that didn't look right in the wrong book. John eleven sixteen. Thomas, who was called Didymus, said to his fellow disciples, after, this is after um, Lazarus has already died, let us go also so that we may die with him. Okay, there you go. How's that? Have your epitaph. Put that on your, on your tombstone. Um, we don't know a ton about Thomas, but we do know that later in life he preached to the Parthians, the Medes, the Persians, also to the Germans, the Hyrokines, the Bactries, and the Magis. I don't even know where half of those names are geographically. He suffered in Calam- Calamina, being slain with a dart. Another one who died for the gospel. Preaching. Next on the list is James, the son of Alphaeus. Since this isn't Jesus' brother James, who um, wrote the epistle and who led the church through the latter half of the book of Acts, um, this is James, the, the brother of, of Judas, who was also called Thaddeus. And so they're both the, the son of Alphaeus. And uh, as some of the lists say of Judas, Judas of James, it just means brother of James. So Ju- Judas and, and James are brothers. Thaddeus, that's his nickname. His real name is Judas of Alphaeus. He's the son of Alphaeus. And in fact, John 14 mentions this Judas, and so it has to say, not Iscariot. So notable and so notorious, of course, was Judas Iscariot who betrayed Jesus. John Fox writes that Thaddeus, who is Judas, the brother of James, preached to the Edessenes, or the Edessens, which is modern-day Turkey, and all Mesopotamia, and he was slain in Berito, which would in John's, in um, John Fox's day, that's actually Beirut. So he was actually slain to death in Beirut, modern-day Lebanon. Simon the Zealot. Zealot is a word um, that just means a devout enthusiast. It's a political and a religious party. It's somebody who's so devoted to the freedom of Israel, they're willing to fight for it. Uh, Emil Schurer writes this, the zealots who wish to not remain in quiet submission until by God's decree the messianic hope of Israel should be fulfilled, but would rather employ the sword in hastening its realization and would rush into conflict with the godless enemy. When a census was addicted by Rome in AD 6, the, uh, the zealots actually took it on themselves to fight to not have to come under Roman accountability for paying taxes to them. In the war for liberation in AD 69 and 70, the zealots were killing anyone who would not stand up to Rome. Of course, Jerusalem was put under siege uh, until AD 70 when they finally, they finally won. But this is a violent sect. It's a group of terrorists. They would carry swords and daggers in order to execute people who got in their way. That's who Simon was. You start to, start to realize this guy's one of the 12, just like Matthew. I mean, these guys couldn't come from op- opposite ends of the spectrum. Um, they couldn't come from more opposite ends of the spectrum. John Fox writes of Simon the Zealot that he preached at Mauritania, northwest Africa on the Atlantic coast, and in Africa and in Britain, and he was crucified. And then there's Judas Iscariot. And as all lists include, some sort of clause explaining he was the one who betrayed Jesus. John 17, 12, Jesus calls him the son of perdition. Look at Mark 14, 21 for a second. Mark 14, 21 
Jesus said, For the Son of Man is, going to, is to go just as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good, or you could even say it would be better, for that man if he had not been born. So great was the guilt that this man incurred by betraying the Lord Jesus Christ that Jesus could say, with no exaggeration, it would be better for him if he had never been born. Does it shock you that this list of 12 includes the one who would betray him? What do you make of that? Jesus was so eminently humble that he remained faithful to Judas all the way up to the very bitter end. He continued to give him every opportunity to grow and excel. He continued to pour into him. He continued to spend time with him. He continued to train him and to teach him about what it meant to follow after God. Do you think Jesus was a failure at making disciples? Did he pick the wrong guy? No and no. I want to leave you guys with a question of how do we think about our own discipleship? It's interesting, as I studied this list, I was pretty impressed as I looked at what we know about these guys from Scripture, which is in most of the cases, at least in the last eight names, it's not a lot. And then even what we hear about in church history, I was actually impressed by the difference between what we do with, with human heroes versus what the Bible does with human heroes. I went back in my mind to a trip I took when I, my wife and I got to see St. John's St. John Lateran uh, Cathedral in Rome is one of the four papal basilicas. It's where the Pope speaks ex cathedra. If you walk into that nave through the main area of that church, there's six apostles on your right and six on your left uh, carved out of stone. And Bartholomew is standing there holding up his own skin and he has in one hand the knife with which he was flayed and his face is hanging down as if he's just holding a bed sheet. And you think about the incredible skill that goes into it and how we would glorify a Bartholomew and then you look at the account and you realize who these guys are. They're just ordinary guys. They're so diverse. They bring so much problem to the, to the whole dynamic of discipleship. Discipleship is complex. Look at what Jesus had on his hands. How impressive is it that he calls us? Look at who he has on his hands. And we get to be part of discipleship. I started thinking about that. I started thinking about the dynamic of why sometimes it's just difficult and challenging. Difficult and challenging to, to give the time and to keep focused on the task. The time and the task of discipleship can sometimes be a, be a threat. And I thought, well, why is that? Why is that? And maybe, you, maybe you feel like you don't want to put forth the time or you don't know that you can help because you might assume that you have nothing to offer others and you've got to get rid of that thinking. If you're a follower after Christ, you need to be in the discipleship process. You need to be in relationships with one another where you are learning one another and the, the rubbing of shoulders is going to produce a greater ability to follow Christ. Find people who are farther down the road than you. Find people who are not as far down the road as you and you always have something to offer if you are a Christian. Another reason why we might not do this is because we might imagine, well, we just don't want to make it a priority because it just, it takes time. Discipleship is consuming of our lives. To follow after Christ, it takes everything. You can't boil it down. You have to say, well, what, well how much time does it take? All of it. <laughs> Let's disciple. Sometimes we imagine that we can disciple by, uh, by you know, not sacrificing the time. And so we kind of do a short, short circuit or a shortcut version of discipleship. And, um, you know, if we did that in our parenting, if we, you'd see the disastrous effects. Christ didn't do that. Christ knew it because he had to give, him, give time for the task. Another reason why I sometimes fear the cost of discipleship is because I fear that it won't produce the fruit that I want to see. And if you've been discipling for any length of time, you know what that's like. You know what it's like to pour into someone for years 
getting up early before the kids are up so you can start discipling and diagramming passages and talking about truth and modeling repentance and feeding them and putting gas money in their car so that they can just be at the res- and get resources and truth and then all, all just years later just rejected entirely. Oh, that wasn't worth it. I'm not doing that again. I've heard of people who've had that response. Jesus had a Judas. How did he do it? He was discipling because he loved his father. He was doing it for his father's glory. And there was no mistake. He wasn't doing it for the idol of fruit. There's nothing wrong with wanting fruit. There's nothing wrong with praying for fruit. But we've got to minister and we've got to be willing to disciple simply because Christ is worthy of it. And so there, here's the time it takes. Here's the task it, that we're aiming at. And let's be a part of this at GBC. Amen? Let's follow in Christ's footsteps and let's be a part of this discipleship process. Father, we're so thankful for the discipleship that you gave to these men because we're still benefiting today thousands of years later. As we end our service singing the praise to you, as we worship you, our heart is also just, we just want to even have in our hearts as we sing a longing to continue discipling and to even disciple better. So Lord, please use us, we pray. Use us for your purposes. I pray that there would be no hindrance in our own heart. Either by way of ignorance or by way of an unwillingness to sacrifice. Uh, Lord, I, I can even just look at Christ's example and I know, I know that no doubt there are things that I could even see in my own life now that are just all too comfortable that would need to go to be able to, to disciple like this. And I'm sure there's things that I don't even see yet um, that could inter- interfere with this. I pray that our desire this morning as a church would be to disciple in, in this manner. And uh, we thank you for the example of Christ this morning. In your name we pray. Amen.